Good evening, everyone. We will have Kevin Lombard, who is the New Mexico State University Farmington Agriculture Science Center Superintendent, um, provide our irrigation methods presentation this morning, this evening. My name is Kevin Lombard. I'm the superintendent of the Ag Science Center Farmington. I'm actually working from home um, and uh, a little bit about myself. I'm a, I'm a horticulturist. Um, so I, I mainly work with um, fruit crops, um, ornamental plants, uh, a little bit with um, small grains and some agroforestry. And I'll just try to cover an overview of maybe more of what I do with irrigation systems. And uh, I'll just be flipping through a bunch of slides and um, photos. Um, so let me try to get the screen sharing here. Okay, so it's a little bit about where I work is uh, the Ag Science Center at Farmington. And well, I guess I'm gonna admit some people too. Um, we're, a, we're a 250 acre uh, facility. We're located uh, on the Navajo Nation, just south of Farmington. Um, we're surrounded by the, the Navajo Agricultural Products Industry Farm. Um, we, we do center pivot uh, uh, sprinkler irrigation work there. Um, and so we have six center pivots, um, but we also have lots of um, smaller plots with uh, what we call solid set sprinklers. And we also have drip irrigation. But um, if you're if you happen to be traveling through the area anytime between eight and four thirty um, p.m. Monday through Friday, we're open to the public, and we we can show you some of the plots and the different types of irrigation systems that we have available. So I invite everyone here to to come um, and um, and check out for yourself what 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 we have going on. Um, so this is a kind of broad-based uh, talk, and I'll, I'll kind of take a a view of the most advanced system that you could that we possibly have at the center is a, what we call the center pivot. This is a circular rotating pivot that they can be as small or large as you want it, um, depending on your pressure. Um, these are very expensive. Uh, they they rotate in a circle. Um, and they and they um, they deliver the water to the field through these drop down um, the drop downs and the these are sprinklers that kind of hang from the the infrastructure there. Uh, they take a lot of work. They're they're main uh, lots of maintenance. Oh, uh, I got a hand up here also. Yeah, Loretta, you wanna you wanna ask a question? Okay. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, my question. I'll try and find the the mute button. Oh, uh, you said it's located in Farmington. Is it um, that road that goes towards uh, east of that uh, the headquarters, Nappy headquarters? Ah, uh, yeah. It's on. It's off of three seventy one. So if you're driving from from Farmington, Farmington? or you're yeah. or you're driving from uh, Crown Point. You can access it on three, Highway 371, and it's actually located by the Region Two Scales um, near the Nappy. Uh, we're close to the Nappy Flour Mill. Oh, okay. So it's just if you know where Region Two Scales are, where the the hay sales are taking place, um, yeah. we're just really close to that and there's a there's a sign that says nappy flour mill then you turn off on that road and you'll you'll be very close to us when you get to the flour mill okay thank you yeah no problem so um these are just some examples of the center pivots and uh, what napi navajo agricultural products industry um use uh so that so they're they're removing water and they have about 600 of these it's one of the largest uh, center pivot farms um, on one 
block of uh, land um, in, the, in the country. And these are these 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 types of pivots are not any, unlike anything that can be scaled down to even the backyard scale, like a with a controller. And so we use these controllers, um, these electronic controllers, to program when we want the the water to turn on, um, when we want it to shut off, um, how do we want it to rotate, and and those kinds of things. So if you go into like Home Depot or Lowe's or any of the irrigation supply stores in Farmington, you can go into the irrigation section of the of the store and you can find um, controllers that are that would be appropriately scaled to. And what the controller allows you to do is walk away from your irrigation. Uh, you can you can time it, turn it off when you want to, turn it off when you want to. And, and walk away. Of course, there's no fail safe or proof um, irrigation method. Uh, you can't just really walk away from anything that you're irrigating. Um, things break down or you have floods or pipe breaks. And so just uh, an example of like being able to automate a system uh, like that. And, and so the nice thing about the center pivot or the sprinkler irrigation uh, systems is that you're you're having a little bit more program placement of water, um, and this is just a, a drone shot of one of our six center pivots there at the science center. Of course, um, we also serve small to medium scale producers in the San Juan La Plata and Animas River Valley. Um, I myself have a farm in Aztec, and we irrigate off of the Animas River. And this is uh, what you, you know you you see from the air when you're um, looking at the at the San Juan Basin. You have nappy oh na nappies over to the south of of the on top of the mesa, but in the river valleys you have these these um, small small producers and farms and homeowners that are um, that maybe irrigating off of a um, off of a uh, canal. And what I mean from that, from this is what a lot of people, including myself, um, how we irrigate is uh, through water diversions. Um, so there'd be an intake off the off the river, and through a head head gates that and canals that water is delivered to different farms. The um, alfalfa valve is is pretty common around here in the valley, and water is delivered through gated pipe. And gated pipe, um, you control the flow through these uh, orange gates that can open and close. Okay, and then, then this is what uh, a field would look like if it's furrowed. And you, you you have the implements and, and you furrow your your field. And, and furrow irrigation is is actually quite quite a useful type of irrigating, um, just because it um, because you can. Um, uh, bring bring up cover crops uh, uh, very efficiently with this type of system, and um, the water can actually recharge back into the river system by going back into the groundwater. Uh, there's studies that have been shown in um, places like all day where sequias are, have a very important role of recharging and moving water back into the river system. Um, but what what I what I'm probably going to focus the most on, and then I can circle back to any questions, um, is drip irrigation. So that's that's pretty much more what I use um, anymore, both for um, uh, perennial crops that are like trees and shrubs and vines, like grapes, um, to annual like vegetable pro um, produce. Um, I, I use the drip system because it, it, it delivers the water right where you need it to go. And so this is just an example of a publication that um, I'll try to get Jesse these, these publications and resources later so she can email them out. Um, but the advantages, the advantages of drip, drip system, and this was originally developed in Israel, Water is delivered directly to plants. Um, it has advantages of less weeds. So with sprinkler and furrow irrigation, you're irrigating more of a surface. And then you also 
not only you're irrigating your crop, but you're also irrigating your weeds. And you can also deliver fertilizer directly into the water. You can automate this so you can um, walk away. There are some disadvantages to strip irrigation. It can be expensive to start with. Um, you have to filter the water. So you can't just uh, hook up a, a, um, a hose to your drip system. Um, you'll clog your emitters. And I'll show some photos of that here in a bit. Uh, you must have some type of backflow prevention if you're using this on your house, because all this, what I'm going to present to you, can be scaled down to your backyard. And you can, if you have access to something like NTUA water, you can hook up a, a small scale drip system off of that. If you don't have access to um, NTUA, you can, and you're hauling water, you can um, use this low pressure drip approach by using a, a water tank elevated like off the back of your pickup truck. Um, if you get just enough head pressure or elevation, um, it could be possible to achieve the use of this system um, by water hauling. Uh, there is a disadvantage that there are some plastics involved. So where does it go when you're done with it? The, most of the durable plastics that go into drip can last decades. Um, this isn't the problem. Um, there are some plastics that that drip systems that won't last as long. So where does it go if you can't recycle it? We can't recycle it around here, but in places like California, you can recycle drip tape. And the learning curve can be a little bit more complex. Um, but these, these are just some, some shots of what uh, maybe a typical drip system may look like. It seems rather compl complicated on the, on the visual and the picture, but it, it's actually quite simple. You have your, your water that comes in. There's a filter involved. This is what this is right here that I, I don't know if you can see my cursor moving around, but there's a filter that's in there. Once the water is filtered out, it goes through into the piping system. In this case, some cases it's on the um, buried, but on other cases it's on the surface. So like this pipe right here is on the surface. And then that's delivering water into these trees. This happens to be in Israel, um, but, but this is just one, one example. You have the main intake. Um, and then you have your large filter, your small filters for going out to the, the sites and your outflows to the fields. Here at the Science Center in Farmington, you would see something like this in our grapes are great plots. So the drip system tube is laid on this on um it, it goes uh, along this uh, it's a, a slightly elevated about a foot. You can see these wet circles. So that's where the drip the drip is dropping the water. It's pitting the water right at the directly at the plant. So you're not irrigating out here, you're irrigating right here. So it's a water conserving technology. This is what a drip system looks like. This happens to this happens to be my farm in Aztec. This is growing um, some vegetables under under drip. This is a what's called drip tape. Um, is a it is actually a very cheap, affordable way of getting into drip, but it doesn't have a very long lifespan. So um, it has its pluses and minuses can be very effective for growing uh, a vegetable this happens to be cabbage um there's some little seedlings coming up here that uh, that were planted uh, alongside the drip paint so you can kind of see them coming up here and then you the weeding that occurs during the growing season um, only occurs in theory occurs around the plant and then this space doesn't get watered um, of course, as I mentioned with drip, you have to have filtration. And this is scaled up or scaled down. Um, so this happens to be the sort of medium scale type of filtration. These are called sand media filters. The sand is, um, they're called sand media filters because they have these enclosed chambers that they're full, full of sand, like it's not really play sand, it's like a really fine 
clean sand. <clears throat> and that um, has a has its um, a property. Sand has its properties because it can filter out any kind of debris, really. And then, and like in this case, it looks it look, it's, it seems rather complicated. It's actually quite simple. Your water's coming in. Water's coming in on this tube right here. It's going into each one of these filters here, and then it comes out. The manifold's taken apart, but it, it'll come out and then go into the field from here. And the reason why on the left there's three of these filters because you, you could back flush or clean out one of these filters one at a time and have the whole system still run. This this is the one that we have at the science center that if you come and visit, I can show it to you. There's two filters, so you can back flush one of them. You can clean it out, clean the debris out that's being filtered through and have the other one flushing or running the water into the field. This is the sand, what it looks like when the lid's off. It's a clean silica sand. And, uh, and so it's, a, it's, it's rather useful. Um, it's more appropriate. This type of filter is more appropriate for a, for a medium to large, larger um, scale, like one acre or more. But it can be quite effective. It's a little bit expensive to get to get started up the front. Um, NRCS, the EQIP program of the NRCS will actually cost share this. So if you, if you have a larger plot of um, of a field that you want to convert over to this type of irrigation system, you can get support through the USDA on on this type of um, program. It's called EQIP. So see. it's automated. There is an automated backflush system on ours, uh, meaning that you could, in theory, walk away from this, um, set it, set it, uh, set it up, turn the water on, have it backflush and clean, and filtering and irrigating your field. In practice, um, you never can walk away from any type of irrigation, irrigating crops or or landscape. You just always have to be keeping an eye on things. Um, this would be more of an appropriate like backyard scale filter. So these are what you might find at Home Depot or Lowe's. And I'm not endorsing any, I'm not endorsing any um, vendor here. Um, we don't, we don't endorse vendors, but if you go into some of the box store stores these days, you can wander around and find the irrigation uh, section. You'll, you'll come across filters like this. And and uh, so the water is coming in and, and then it'll be filtered through like a screen filter like this is an example of what it looks like. Because if you don't filter your water, as I said, that dirty water could go into your drip, your drip tubing and clog it, it'll clog it up. So you got to have a good filtration. Um, this is what it looks like, uh, dirty water. This is off of the uh, lower Animus Ditch here in San Juan County. As I was saying, you can't really walk away from something like this because then your, your filter will get clogged up and then your pressure will go down. So you got to pull your filters out and clean them once in a while. But this is an example of a screen type of filter. This uh, particular type of filter is a banjo. It's called a banjo. It's the brand of it. And um, they run about a hundred bucks. These are more, more appropriate for like a little bit larger size systems. Um, and this is this is what it looks like when it's hooked up to the drip of your filter. This is when your water would be coming in and be going through the filter right here. And then cleaner water would be going into your field, into your around your landscape. And this is a polytubing that hooks up. This polytubing, this type of polytubing will have a lifespan of decades. So we, we have some polytubing here in Farmington that we find it's still um, intact and, it, and it's at least 30, 30 years old. So it, does, it has a long lifespan, this, this type of um, durable polytubing. And you can also find it at many box stores. This is about a half inch 
It usually comes in half inch or three quarter inch diameter. Again, just some shots of the different types of filters, why it's important to have a filter on a drip irrigation system. Um, just some other shots, you're, you're capturing your debris and that kind of stuff with the filter filtration. Um, this is a little bit larger type of filter. Uh, again, the, again, the goal of, with a drip system is to capture as much debris and fine particles before it goes into your field. Um, this is the, called a disk filter. It's just a different type of um, a filter for going into uh, irrigation. Um, and it's just a stack of like, basically donuts that are stacked on top of each other. They're fine. Um, they capture the, the particles in between those, those layers. It's a little more expensive than the screen filter. <coughs> this is um, a series of, of uh, photos just showing some of the versatility of, of having a drip system around one's landscape. Uh, this is like a palm tree, for instance. And in this situation, this happens again to be in Israel, they're using recycled water. And that's why it's the, the drip system is colored purple. And then in places like California, you might come across the same thing. You might come across like a purple water line um, or drip system. And that's just an indication that they're using recycled water, wastewater to irrigate landscaping. Um, so the thing I like about drip is that you can irrigate around trees and shrubs in your landscape. This isn't necessarily a farm set, uh, setting. It's a, um, but if you can imagine, you know, trying to go out with your garden hose, maybe, and irrigate all these plants individually. The advantages of laying out something like this would be that you have the water being placed where the plant is. You can, your time savings for irrigating around your, your garden could be saved um, rather than just um, using a water can or a garden hose. It's just another advantage of using drip system in my opinion. Um, there, there's always, there's infinite, infinite ways of splicing and creating new lines. Um, different couplers can be used, um, key, key fittings or, um, or different types of, uh, you know, taking it in different directions. The tubing is very flexible and durable, so you can run it all, all around wherever you want to. I like to actually and say that the thing that I like about this type of setup on the surface, if you have a leak, you can find it really fast and fix it. Um, I don't really do anything more buried anymore because if you have a a leak, you have to get the shovel out and spend time digging up uh, digging up your your irrigation system, which is time consuming and uh, so I like I just like to leave, leave things on the surface like this. Um, there's some there's actually things you can employ that are passive. And just an example where you don't even have to have an irrigation system. You can use rainwater rainwater capturing. And in this case, these these trees are planted in a lower um, they're, they're planted in lower um, elevation. So when it rains on this surface, the water runs into the where the trees are located. So you don't have to limit yourself to just some type of pressurized uh, irrigation system, if that makes any sense. <clears throat> Here's some more, just some more photos of um, what it looks like to have like a garden bed or, or something where you might be able to um, lay out your, your garden. You might be able to lay out your garden in, um, in all different configurations. 
and, and just place the water directly where the plant is rather than like being a sprinkler on top of this. And just some, some approaches to utilizing this type of system for, um, for gardening, even with ornamentals. Um, this is a lavender farm that's in, it's in um, near Blanco. And you can see these little spaghetti tubes that are irrigating each little plant. This is lavender. And then in each little plant is getting watered. The, the rows are not getting watered. So there's not a lot of water, water wastage happening. Okay, I mean, these are high value uh, crops too, by the way. If you're gonna employ something like this, you could have several different motivations for it. One, you don't have time. You want to just be able to irrigate a larger section at once um, around your home or your farm. Uh, number two, you have a high value crop. It justifies the expense up front of the system. So um, you got to think about how much how much you want to spend on these kinds of things. Um, just some more shots of how we use it at the Science Center. I think I showed this photo already. I mentioned that we use it here because we have specialty crops. We, we do cut flowers and vegetables. And, um, and the, the USDA NRCS will actually have a cost share on it. I mentioned that earlier. It's called the EQIP. Is that, and so, um, if you're in San Juan County, you would go over to the Aztec office and you would talk to Shambliss Lantana. If you were um, on the Navajo Nation in Shiprock or anywhere else, you would go to the St. Michael's office. And I, I'm trying to think of the director's name, but the, but the NRCS office is in St. Michael's. Um, as I mentioned, specialty crops and converting to drip. Um, that may be something you want to work, um, look into if you're a producer. That, that these are the types of programs that might be covered. Um, these are some other examples of crops that we're growing. Just want to again point out, like we don't have to weed down the middle of this. Our main focus is weeding um, where the crop is located. So um, there are some really good YouTube videos. On, on the subject that uh, this, uh, this YouTube um, site, if you wanna write that down, it's called uh, the Ziri Center. And my colleague, Dan Smill, who's now retired, put a, put a number of videos up there. One of them is called How to Set Up a Drip Irrigation System. Um, there, there. That's a, that was put up ten years ago, but it still um, gets a lot of uh, views, and the information is still very relevant. So I encourage, um, I encourage you all to just to, to wander over to some of these YouTube videos. If you want to learn more about the uh, Science Center at Farmington, you can navigate over to our our website there, and um, and as I mentioned. I'd be more than happy to, to show you around the center and the demonstration plots that we have from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And then I would be happy to introduce you to my colleague, uh, Dr. Kofi Jaman, who's also doing quite a bit of uh, work in the area of irrigation, um, soil moisture probes. And, um, and he's an uh, he's um, agricultural engineer. It's a um, drought that we're experiencing now. Um, it's uh, going to be cause for thinking about how we use the, utilize our water. And um, so these are just kind of some of these uh, examples of what, what we got going on, um, going on at our facility. I think that's, I think that's pretty much all I have. I do want to mention that we are going to have a field day on July 15th. Um, it'll be, the announcement will be coming out soon. I, we don't have an announcement, but 
July 15th, if you want to put that on your calendar, um, we want to invite you to come out and, and see the different activities that we're doing. So I think I'll just go ahead and end it there and just leave it leave it open for question Q&A and whatever anyone wants to discuss. Okay, um, if you guys have some questions, uh, raise your hand um, and unmute yourself and ask uh, Kevin your questions. Um, but in the meantime, I do have a question in regards to the uh, gravity flow drip irrigation. Do you have, um, you know, a parts listing going from the barrel out to to the garden? Uh, yes, we do. It is a it's on on a publication. I don't know what the number is um, offhand, but there is a publication on the New Mexico State University Cooperative Extension Locations website. And, and if you go to that website and just type in the search under irrigation, I'm sure you can find it there. Okay. Um, okay. And I can send it to you. I can send it to you, um, um, Jesse, if you want to post some resources later sure. or send them out to the attendees. Okay. Sure. I could do that. And then also, you know, I've noticed, um, you know, when you go down to Home Depot to get a filter, they have kind of like the two in one, um, a pressure, a pressure regulator, and then also the filter. Where can you find just the filter if you're using the gravity flow system? Oh, um, so, okay. So on your question, the reason why they have that two in one is a, what um, Jesse is referring to as a pressure reducer is like, at least here where I live, the, the, um, the irrigation pressure is about 60 PSI coming out of the top. That's really high and it'll blow all your fittings apart. I mean, you'll literally blow everything apart. It's, and so the pressure reducer is what you're referring to actually reduces that pressure down to accommodate the system um, to, so that you're not um, bursting all your, your fittings apart. Um, you might still be able to find just a single filter at like a place like Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, if you have a low flow, there is a vendor in Farmington called, um, I want to say it's called Raindrops. And they they have they have a number of different types of filters of the screen types. Um, there's also a number of vendors online that are they're probably cheaper actually. One of them, one of the online vendors is called Dripworks. Um, so if you just go into Google and you type drip irrigation, you'll you can pull up some of these vendors. Um, that's another option. I don't know what it is like in Gallup. <clears throat> I don't know what the stores are like there. Um, okay. What was your What was the other question? What was the other part? Um, just... Right, that was um, the first part, and then the second part. I noticed that you know they do have the half half inch poly tubing to where you know when we were putting in the garden at ODY and Crown Point. Um, you know, it's just the, the hose and you poke it and then you put the emitter in. But now I notice that they are having, um, they, they are selling hoses with um, emitters that are, I don't know what you would call it, pre-emitters. <laughs> so it's like, They're yeah. built in. They're right, built in built emitters. In. So, you know, what's, what's the difference in them? Is it, you know, beneficial because of, you know, down here in uh, Crown Point region, there's a lot of um, salinity and that clogs the emitters and you got to take them off. Is there an advantage for having a, a drip tape that is already, that has the emitter built in? Um, so the, the, the only advantage of having the emitter built in is that you can have it spaced out like one foot every foot or every two feet or any increment that you want to choose. So that if you're doing a row crop, 
and you have a, you know, you have your spacing of like your lettuce or whatever you're growing um, and you have it spaced out that that built in emitter ensures that uniformity. Um, the I don't know the the time it saves a lot of time. Um, it saves a lot of time for having them built in. But you're right, like the salinity will clog up the emitters. And that's one thing you have to do. And I, I didn't have a good photo of it, but you always have to open up the ends of the tubes and flush them out because even the best filter will allow fine sediments to get in there. And so you really need to flush your system out, just open everything up and let the water flow out because otherwise you're, 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 you are going to get clogged emitters. I saw one question or a couple of questions. Can you use um, just tap water without a filter? Um, the answer is no, you should, you should go ahead and put a filter on regardless if you're running tap water because you never know what might come through that. Um, I saw another question about, can I use the water and ship rock? You need a, a, a tap a, a filter for tap water and ship rock. I, I would I would I'd put a filter on even if you're running it off your 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 NTUA um, or your your house. Just to, just as a, it's just an insurance policy, and you're in when you're running it on that on your house again. What Jesse brought up earlier, you're one going to have that pressure reducer also because your your tap water is under pressure. So you want to get your you're going to want to get a pressure reducer and a filter. Right. And while we're on the subject, the pressure reducer, I know, is there a way to measure the pressure that's coming out of, um, you know, your house or uh, gardens, you know, your water source? Is there a way to measure it? Because. I know a couple of um, places in Crown Point, the water coming off the house, you use a filter with the built-in um, reducer, pressure reducer, and the pressure is still high. And then, you know, is it a good idea to add another um, pressure reducer or would it be best to test the pressure and then find the right pressure reducer? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, the, the there are at least one of the last times I checked, like again at one of the box stores, they had a, a pressure gauge. You know, it's like a round gauge that has the hose um, threads on it, and you just screw that into your garden hose or the end of your outlet on your on your house. And it would give you the pressure coming off your house to give you an idea of what exactly is there. And they weren't that expensive. They're like 10 bucks. You could buy one of those. And they're right there in the drip, drip irrigation section. Okay, great. Thank you, Kevin. And then one last question. We do have farmers out there in Shiprock area, um, you know, some beginning farmers and is your staff or yourself available to you know work with them as far as um, guiding them to what type of material they would need, um, either drip irrigation, flood irrigation? Yeah, we could you know we could we can work with folks and um, in fact, we're going to try to be in Crown Point next week, I think. And then we still go back and forth into Shiprock. Um, so if we have something scheduled. Um, we could we could make a house. We could we could try to make a home visit. Okay, great. Um, I think we're we're pretty done with the Q and A, um, Kevin. So um, thank you again for setting aside time. Um, to provide your presentation. Oh, we got a raised hand here. Go ahead, Loretta. Good evening. Uh, this presentation seems really awesome. I think only for the people that live along the river bed. What about us over here in Crown Point? Uh, you mentioned about the ODY having their um, plant section. 
And uh, my kids were saying, um, we'll just get a, a landfill over here and put up the fence and start our own uh, vegetable and fruit. And I didn't know that you had to have um, a filter and, and et cetera. So that's why I was asking you, where was the um, your plant location at? Now you're saying in region two by the flour mill. So we can take a look at take a look at that. But um, my kids are really interested in um, something like that. They they're so they're saving up the melon seeds, corn, and squash. I think the squash. And they, they want to do their own. And uh, they love to cook. That's why I say that what they're doing that. But I just need to know how it started and and etc. And we do have. Um, water available in our home, but I wanted to get that um, Dorothy installed, the hand drip, handheld drip. I'm trying to get it installed. I know I probably can do it, and but I just need to put my act together and get it installed. So that, that's my question. Do you have anything for Crown Point section? Oh, uh, you know, um, as Jesse mentioned, we had that ODY project. Um, then they built they built out, I guess, a new activity center or something, and the garden got got moved. So it's it's my understanding that that garden is supposed to start getting reestablished again, and um, and it might be in collaboration with the the IHS uh, also. Um, so. You know, Jesse, we're going to be in Loretta. We're going to be down. We're going to try to be down there next week, and just um, kind of, kind of scoping it out and 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 trying to trying to circle back to some of the Yago project. Um, so I know we had the low pressure drip, the elevated drip tank there, um, and I'll, you know, Jesse, if you can remind me, like in an email, just. Um, I'll send you all the resources I got on the subject matter so that you can send it out to this group. Okay. Yeah. And I can um, help on that question for Loretta. Um, if you do need uh, a material listing, I do have one and it's for a very small, small scale garden, like a 25 by 30 foot garden. And so if you have running water, that makes it easier. Um, and I can send you the list that starts from the spigot and then all the way down to where your garden is located. And then also, um, you know, we can go over soil amendments. What are you going to add to the soil? Where's your garden location, et cetera. And that's what we're here for um, the NSA project and we'll collaborate with Kevin. Kevin's an expert, <laughs> so we can work off of that. That sounds good, Jesse, thank you. No problem, just send me an email and then um, we'll, we'll schedule something out. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I see one other question on irrigation methods for alfalfa. Um, so on that, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not an expert in alfalfa, but most of the producers around here are using either furrow irrigation methods or sprinkler irrigation methods like side rolls or side roll or um, center pivot. And you could come out to the Science Center Farmington to see those types of irrigation methods. Okay, great. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you everyone for your questions and um, joining us this evening. Um, I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. And um, you know, for our pol poultry producers, we'll be having a webinar next week um, provided by Marcy Ward. Um, you know, registration is required if you go to our website. Upcoming events. Um, You'll find the, the link there. If not, if you're already on our, you know, our email listing, you'll get a reminder uh, next week to join. Um, so look out for that information. And then we also have it on our Facebook, um, <clears throat> our Facebook page. And then the webinar is recorded. Um, we will post it on YouTube channel with all the other webinars that we have hosted. Um, 
the Navajo Sustainable Agriculture Project um, is a New Mexico uh, Cooperative Extension Service initiative delivered in collaboration with the Ned College Land Grant Office and the COPE program, which is the Community Outreach and Patient Empowerment Program. Uh, the project is funded by USDA's Outreach and Assistance for Socially Disadvantaged Farmers and Ranchers and Veteran Farmers and Ranchers Program. Uh, we have two field staff out here, which is myself um, and then also Kelly Lantana, and then also our project director, Dr. Michael Patrick. Okay, we do have three goals um, within our project. The first one, as you can see, is to improve the operations and profitability and sustainability of socially disadvantaged uh, Navajo farmers and ranchers and veteran farmers and ranchers. Um, and then secondly, we are increasing um, Navajo farmers and ranchers knowledge and use of USDA programs such as NRCS, FSA, rural development and risk management agency programs and service and those of other resource providers. And um, lastly, we are um, increasing the local production and consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables and healthy food by Navajo families and individuals. 